in a truly calamitous situation. And also you don't need me to tell you that there's been a huge amount of coverage uh, of the crisis in the media. Certainly at this stage, most of it wearisome in the extreme. And if you ask me, all of that coverage has generated a lot of heat, but not much light. Lots of we are where we are, protestations about it's the fault of the other crowd and most frustrating of all and we hear this all the time the mantra that there is no alternative to the strategies currently being pursued I believe there is an explanation for the consensual one-dimensional nature of the coverage some of you who know me would be surprised that about the person I'm about to quote and that is Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman was the father of neoliberal capitalism and, and because of that, he's probably the author of our current downfall, the collapse of financial capitalism. He was also the mentor of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan and Colonel uh, Pinochet in Chile. But what Friedman said was that radical change can only take place in the context of a crisis. And the nature of that change will be determined by the dominant ideas that prevail before and during the crisis. Now, I think this is uh, a truth that uh, he says. But for us, the problem is that, by and large, the forum for ideas, that is, the newspapers, magazines, radio and TV, are largely controlled today by the establishment and by big business. So this means huge vested interests ensure that their version of events and their economic strategies dominate all debate. Any rational person would have thought that after the catastrophic collapse of the system, due in the main to lax regulation and the unfettered pursuit of profit, sensible reconstruction would entail a rigorous regulation of the financial sector in order to ensure that such madness could not prevail again. Sadly, this has not been the case so far. There is no indication that any lessons have been learned. In fact, they seem hell-bent on putting back in place the very strategies that got us into the mess in the first place. Actually, it's even far worse than that. Adopting as a slogan, never waste a good crisis, they are taking advantage of the depressed situation in order to drive down wages, cut welfare benefits and services, and privatize national assets. This strategy amounts to nothing less than a massive redistribution of wealth in our society. Now, all my life I've argued in favor of the redistribution of wealth, but what I have always had in mind was the creation of a fairer and more equitable society. This time, however, the process seems to involve the transfer of wealth from the poor and vulnerable to the privileged and powerful. You could call it socialism for the rich. I believe that what we are witnessing today is a class war happening in slow motion. Tragically, all the gains of the last hundred years, won by the ceaseless struggle of working people, are being eroded on an almost daily basis. Without doubt it's a shocking state of affairs. Nowadays I frequently hear people suggesting that the current crisis represents the worst catastrophe ever to befall the Irish people. Well, bad as it is, this is hardly the case. In fact, compared to the great famine of the 19th century, our current economic woes are more akin to a walk in the park. Allow me to explain. As a consequence of the failure of the potato crop and the handling of the situation by the authorities, one million people died and over one million people 
losing faith in any future in Ireland, deserted the land. Today, as a result of the failure of the economy, no one has yet died. Well, perhaps I should rephrase that. As a consequence of cutbacks and chronic mismanagement, people have probably died within our so-called healthcare system. But thankfully, the numbers so far are relatively small. Nevertheless, I think it's worth our while drawing some comparisons between the catastrophe of the Great Irish Famine of the mid-19th century and the meltdown of the Irish economy in the first decade of the 21st century, especially the role played by the respective authorities. In the 19th century, as a consequence of the Act of Union, the Irish people exercised no sovereignty whatsoever. All legislation and policy formulations emanated from Westminster, where the government itself was constrained by ideological and economic doctrines. Most significantly, significantly, its reluctance to interfere with the sanctity of the market, marketplace. This sounds familiar, I think. Today, when some people question the morality of bankrupting the people in order to protect the bondholders, they are swiftly told that the markets demand such action. In the 19th century, Ireland was part of a large economic union, so you would have expected that the rules that were enforced in Ireland would have been the same as those in the rest of the United Kingdom. However, as the Irish Poor Law of 1838 demonstrated, there were a number of important differences regarding the treatment of pauperism in England and in Ireland the Irish Poor Law being more inflexible and more parsimonious than its English counterpart. Today, we ourselves have discovered that in spite of being part of a large economic union, namely the European Union, we find ourselves subjected to treatment quite different to that experienced by some of our more prosperous neighbours. Interest rates, and they're in the news at the moment, interest rates on loans being one obvious example. In the course of the Irish famine, in order to justify their actions, or sometimes lack of action, the British authorities frequently resorted to blaming the Irish themselves for their misfortune. Sir Charles Trevelyan, permanent secretary to the Treasury and commander-in-chief of famine relief, but probably better known today from a line in the fields of Athen Rye, referred to the famine as the judgment of God on an indolent and unself-reliant people a people, moreover, who like to make a poor mouth. At the same time, the English popular press published racist cartoons depicting the Irish as ape-like layabouts and drunkards. Such racist stereotyping would be instantly recognised today by the Greek people, who have had to listen to themselves being constantly described as lazy and corrupt beggars by German and French politicians. If there is one lesson to be learned from this short comparative analysis between two great Irish calamities, it is that actually nothing ever changes. The rich and powerful will always ensure that the poor and vulnerable pay whatever price is necessary in order to ensure the survival of the status quo. So what are we to do? Certainly the strategies that are currently being pursue, pursued by the Irish establishment at the behest of our masters of the IMF and the EU are causing enormous pain to the Irish people. Unemployment figures are still rising, incomes are falling, and cutbacks are having devastating effects on the lives of our people, while the economy still falters. But why should we expect these strategies pursued by the IMF and the EU to work for the Irish people? After all, they're not designed to help the Irish people. Their real purpose is to protect the European banks and international bondholders and to endeavour to ensure the survival of the Euro. Ireland's survival is only of peripheral interest to our current masters. Once again, I ask the question, what are we to do? Certainly, I don't believe that there's any point in looking to Minster House for any sense of leadership or vision in terms of dealing with the crisis. The troika of parties, namely Fine Gael, Labour and Fianna Fáil, have all signed up to the notion that there is no alternative to the strategies dictated by the IMF and the EU. This is, in, a, in effect, an admission that they themselves have no vision or imagination whatsoever 
and consequently they have succumbed to the role of simply carrying out orders. After the catastrophe of the famine in the 19th century, the Irish people, feeling totally betrayed by the authorities, slowly began to develop alternative strategies to the previous reliance on politicians in order to claw their way back from the brink. The approach was socio-cultural rather than directly political. Horace Plunkett and George Russell traveled the length and breadth of the country, a lot of the time on bicycles, encouraging the rural people to establish cooperative ventures. This proved to be not only a successful commercial development, but more importantly, it was a self-empowering initiative. At roughly the same time, Michael Cusick and others founded the GAA, which right from the start had social and cultural objectives, as well as the primary role of developing and supporting our native games. The success of the GAA has been extraordinary, and to this day, it has played a significant part in the life of every community across the land. Douglas Hyde, fearing that a separate Irish cultural identity might disappear altogether, wrote a hugely important essay entitled The Need for the De-Anglicization of Ireland. In pursuit of this goal, he became involved with others in founding in 1893 Conor Gaelic League, which became an important cultural focus for all those who were committed to the revival of the Irish language. Undoubtedly, Conor de Gaelga exercised an enormous, indeed revolutionary influence on key aspects of Irish life between 1893 and 1916. The establishment of an Irish national theatre was another important cultural initiative. The poet W. B. Yeats wrote, we hope to find in Ireland an uncorrupted and imaginative audience trained to listen with its passion for oratory. We will show that Ireland is not the home of buffoonery and of easy sentiment as, as it has been represented, but the home of an ancient idealism. The Abbey Theatre became a national focus for the ideas and dreams that would chart Ireland's future. In view of the wretched conditions of many of the poorer classes, it is not surprising that the unskilled workers of Belfast and Dublin and many of the other cities began to organize and to form trade unions in order to protect themselves. The leading figures were James Larkin and James Connolly. The employers despised Larkin and in 1913 locked out the members of his union, the ITGWU. The violence faced by the workers during the lockout inspired Connolly to found the <coughs> Irish Citizen Army, a force that would play a crucial role in the 1916 Rising. What's really interesting about most of the societies or groups that were established in Ireland during the last 20 years of the 19th century and the first 10 years of the 20th century is that even though they faced a truly desperate situation, they looked to their own resources, drew on their own imagination, and determined that the future of Ireland would be in their own hands. They were alarmed at the seemingly inexorable assimilation of Irish culture to that of England. In fact, they feared that the very survival of a separate Irish identity was at stake. They became convinced that Ireland's survival could only be achieved through the establishment of an independent sovereign republic. Today, even though social, cultural, and political conditions are very different to those of the late, late 19th century, Ireland still faces a similar existentialist dilemma. I believe that those of us who are concerned about the very survival of a sovereign, independent Ireland can profitably look to the revival movement of the late 19th century in order to gain strength and inspiration for the mouth task ahead. Gurmai 